grandfather came into the Meaford area. He had been attending university, as I understand it, going through for a doctor. Due to a family problem, he was unable to complete his doctoring courses in the university, so he quit school. And he came to the Bayview area near Meaford. He established a farming business there. There's a report on him in the museum in Meaford and uh, the library in Meaford as well and said that he just came into that area with a lot of ambition, a great vision of the future and an axe over his shoulder. There were no doctors in the Meaford area at that time in Bayview area so he began to practice doctoring there even though he had never qualified, he had never he had never graduated from university, but there were no there were no doctors to help people, and if you're sick, anything is better than nothing. So he got called upon to do go out on many many calls, doctoring people. When he wasn't doctoring people, he was doctoring animals, and he established a couple of little factories there to give employment. <coughs> he established a big farm there, and he then. Uh, uh, his family took over the farm. They, they uh, began to operate the farm. He had a license for uh, conducting weddings. He was the town sheriff and the justice of the peace because there were very few people that were qualified to do that type of thing. And he had what was considered at that time a superior, a superior education, so that's uh, why he got into those things. My, <clears throat> my grandfather was killed in a very unfortunate accident. After raising 15 children in that area, uh, one of his sons had taken over the farm up at Bayview, and they had built a new barn, and there was a rack lifter in it that lifted the loads of hay up so that they could fork it off into the, into the hay mow, and a pulley broke up on the end of the barn and uh, f flew and, and hit my grandfather on the head. He was well over 80 at that time, and he was killed instantaneously. My great-grandfather, I'm sorry, I said my uh, grandfather. But uh, uh, my grandfather at that time moved down to uh, near Markdale. He was raised at Meaford. He moved near Markdale, and he established a farm there. Now, my mother's parents came from Northern Ireland, a little village called Inniskillen in County Fermanagh. My, uh, my grandfather and my grandmother came out in the mid-1880s. My grandfather came on a sailing vessel and he was two months coming across the Atlantic Ocean. And my grandmother came on a steamboat a year or two later and she was not nearly so long. They got employment with Sir Edward Blake in Toronto my grandfather was the butler and my grandmother was the cook and that is where they had met. They never met in Ireland although they came from the same village. They were married. They moved to Godridge for a little while, then up to Muskoka, then back to Markdale uh, at Harkaway, near Harkaway United, uh, Methodist Church. At that time there was no church there. There was just uh, a little bush church. but. That's how my father and my mother met. They were only a couple of miles apart. My father took over the farm from my grandfather in that area and was uh, my, when my father and mother were married, it was 12 years before I came along, so they had the farm nicely established. But then when I came along, my father said that he wasn't going to keep that farm much longer because he had three miles to walk to school and uh, I wasn't going to have that distance to walk. When he was a little boy, he and some of the neighbor fa children were walking to school, and many mornings they had to turn back from school because there was a long swamp and there were bears playing on the road, and they never did get to school. They had to come back home again, so therefore a lot of children were deprived of a lot of their education. In the winter time, it was ridiculous going so far. So my father sold that property, and bought a farm at Orange Valley. Orange Valley is located halfway between Markdale and Fresherton on number 10 highway. Our home
home was directly across from the Orange Valley School. Our lane, when we come out our lane, we just entered the school gate. It would be probably 30 rods from the from the house to the schoolhouse. That was the extent of the, the mileage that I had to cover going to school. It was just 30 rods to public school. We moved to Orange Valley on the 10th of March, 1919. My father appreciated that farm because it had an excellent brick house on it and a good solid bank barn, 60 feet square to keep the cattle in, a good hen house and a good sheep pen. The farm that my father was raised on when he moved there as a little boy only had old log buildings and my grandparents there had to build a new house and a new barn. My, grand, my mother's uh, parents had the same experience. They had to build a new house and a new barn. And my father said he didn't need any more building buildings. He had enough of that when he was a little boy, building barns. But I remember well moving to that farm in 1919 on the 10th of March when uh, there were a lot of sleigh loads of uh, machinery and animals and chickens and whatever was required. Came to the farm, the neighbors, uh, the previous neighbors and my parents bought several sleigh loads of things. My mother and I came with a horse and cutter. And as we drove in the lane, there was a big yellow cat sitting on the back kitchen step. I remember that cat very well. It was a beautiful, beautiful cat. I don't ever remember any more about it, but I just remember it being there when we, when we moved to the farm. I also remember a sleigh filled with sheep. There was a, a rack on the sleigh and, and they had uh, a number of sheep in there. I just remember going by the house. I don't remember anything more about those either. But I do remember them unloading the, the house uh, furniture and I remember them unloading the stove. And uh, my father and some of the men got together and got the stove set up. It was a wood-burning stove at the time. Naturally, that's all there was. There was no hydro. And they got a fire on as quickly as possible because there had been nobody living in the house for maybe the matter of a few days. And in March, it was pretty cold. And the house had to be warmed up. It was in the evening by that time. And the men had to be fed before they went all the way back after they unloaded all their produce. They had to be uh, have their supper before my parents would let them drive because they had nine miles to drive back where they came from. My father bought that farm from Tom Montgomery for $8,500. 26 years later, he sold it to Lauren Bumpstead for $9,000. That was the extent of the capital gain on properties in those days. I remember well starting to that little schoolhouse in Orange Valley. Being so close to the school, the children were out there playing every day in the yard at recess and at noon hour, and I wanted to go over and play with the children. And while I was only five years of age, uh, the, my parents consented to start me to that little school. Miss Margaret Leslie was the teacher at that time, and uh, she was a, a lovely, a lovely girl. There was about, I would say, 30 students attending the school at that time for one teacher. And all the, the number of grades, it wasn't grade one, two, three, and so on. It was primer and first book and uh, junior first and, and senior first and junior second uh, and, and senior second right through to uh, senior eight. And then, of course, that meant going to high school. <laughs> Very often uh, my parents would go shopping in the afternoon and I would be uh, uh, obliged to do something after school if they were not home. So I got my instructions to always go over and stay with Willis and Mr. and Mrs. Coburn at their farm just south of the schoolhouse. So this particular evening in the fall of the year I went over there to Coburn's and when my parents came home uh, they phoned over to tell me to come home. So I left Coburn's to walk up the highway and, and uh, going to come home. It was only a short distance, but when I got as far as the schoolhouse, I saw a light in the schoolhouse. Well, a little boy, about five or six years of age, was naturally nervous of a light in the school. So I ran back to Coburn's and, and they phoned my parents to see if uh, my father would come and meet me. 
So he came walking to meet me, and when he got near the school, he saw the same light in the schoolhouse. And uh, he went over and looked in the window to investigate, and the school floor was on fire. The caretaker had placed the kindling on top of the, of the stove to dry out, and uh, went away home and forgot about it. It was uh, entirely an error. It was not done intentional. And uh, this, the kindling had taken fire and fallen off the, sco the stove and uh, fallen on the floor, and the floor caught fire, and the fire was burning under the floor. Well, my father immediately ran on to, to Coburn's house and got on, got on the telephone and phoned the, the caretaker at that time, who was one of the Alcox boys. And they came with the key and the men got in and, and uh, several people carried water and, and they got the fire out. It, built, it burned a hole in the floor, probably a couple of feet square. And the fire was burning under the floor, so I can I can remember yet the men lying on the floor with their arms away in that hole as far as they could with wet, wet rags, making sure that they got the last sparks out of there. But the school went on the next day, as usual, with a big patch over the hole. We attended school there for a few months, and uh, uh, probably uh, would probably be the next fall. I left for school in the morning, and I saw a big smoke behind the schoolhouse. So I ran back into the house and told my parents that there was a big smoke over there. They looked and one of my parents said, oh my goodness, the school must be on fire again. So my father ran with me to the school and my mother got on the telephone and started to phone all the neighbors again. All the men came running and the school was on fire all right. There was a big woodshed out behind the school that, uh, that held the fuel for the for the entire woods, uh, the amount of wood that it took to burn all winter. And the boys had carried a lot of hay in and put on top of the wood to make beds, to have fun. This, the grass had been cut on the schoolyard and never gathered up, so the kids thought that was great fun to carry it in. And somebody got playing with matches and the hay caught on fire and the wood caught on fire and the school caught on fire. I can remember well, they, them, uh, they couldn't get the fire out. There was no way because there was a great big pile of wood, probably 40 cords in it all on fire. So they ran in the front doors and started carrying out desks, or trying to carry out desks. They were all screw nailed to the floor. And of course, the screw nails wouldn't let go. So they jerked these desks until they broke the legs off a lot of the desks. Some of the desks come out with one leg broken off and some with two legs broken off, some with leaf three legs broken off. There was only about probably five or six inches broken off the end of the, the leg, but anyway, uh, they were a mess. Uh, they were all old-fashioned double desks, and they were so carved up with boys' initials uh, carved into them that you couldn't hardly write on them anyway. But the school burned to the ground. And what were we to do then with no schoolhouse? It was only a matter of a day or so until the school board uh, committee and the Orange Hall committee uh, got together and the school board rented the Orange Hall. Now the schoolhouse was located at the extreme south side of McFadden's farm. The Orange Hall was at the extreme north side of McFadden's farm, which was just a distance, uh, the width of a hundred acre farm, which was not very far, a quarter of a mile maybe. So they obtained some new desks and uh, some new blackboards. I remember the blackboards. They were, they were sort of a canvas with a black front, and they all rolled up. And uh, those were our blackboards, and we held school in there all winter long. It was pretty small. Again, there was an old box stove at the top, at the back of the school, but it was too hot near the school and uh, near, near the stove, and and too cold if you got away from it. But <clears throat> there, that place was filled because there must have been about 30 students attending that little bit of a of a hall. But we got through there. The following summer, a contract was given to, to Mr. John Dillon and Mark Dill, and he built us a nice new school. I remember them yet laying the bricks and, and putting up the architecture, putting in the cement floor, and doing everything. And in September, I believe it would be 1922, we started into our, into our brand new schoolhouse. It was, it was a beautiful, a beautiful new building for the students to, to uh, all move into. Uh, at that time, Mrs. Hare was our teacher, 
Mrs. Hare was a widow in Markdale. She had a son by the name of Everett and a daughter uh, by the name of Dorothy. And Mrs. Hare uh, walked from Markdale to, to that schoolhouse in Orange Valley every day in the morning and home at night through rain or shine to teach in that school. She was paid the sum of $1,000 a year. She was there for five years. That was the highest paid public school teacher in that entire area at that time. But the board felt that she, she was an experienced teacher and that if there was any financial consideration to be given that she should receive it because she was receiving, uh, was raising her two family, uh, two of a family all by herself. She taught there for the five years. She was, she was, did a, a, a very, very fine job there. I, I passed my entrance with, uh, with Mrs. Hare there. She, uh, I just don't remember the teacher that, that came there after that. I think it was maybe Mrs. Uh, Bertha Ottawa. But uh, I do know that in those days there would be three day storms in the winter time. There was no such thing as open roads or open highways. There were no such things as snow plows other than just a little horse plow to plow a track for the horse to follow. It would storm for three days steady. And Mrs. Hare at that time, if she got uh, isolated at school, she would stay at our, at our home. She would come after school at four o'clock, have her supper, stay all night, have her breakfast in the morning, and my mother would pack her lunch to go back to school again. And my mother received one dollar a day for, for that uh, board. Uh, there was no method of transportation in those days, only by horse and, and buggy or horse and cutter in the winter time. The roads were mostly single, single lane, single track, and if, uh, two horses uh, and buggies, uh, uh, two horses and cutters rather, or horses and sleighs were to meet. There was no turning out places, and one would have to get off into the deep snow, and sometimes part of the load would would slide off in the snowbank, and it was. Uh, it was a quite an experience, but we were very, very happy. We were very, very happy. My father grew a marvelous garden. My mother was a wonderful cook, and we had full and plenty of everything. There was no money of any account, but, but we had full and plenty of, of everything. We didn't, we didn't wish for, for anything at all. When my parents went shopping uh, in the fall of the year, the first uh, snowfall, my father said he didn't like using the wagon. It was too bumpy with all steel tires. So the first time he would take the sleigh to Markdale to shop, he would bring home a case of, of peas and or two and a case of tomato soup and a couple of cases of canned tomatoes and, and three or four hundred pound bags of flour and a couple of hundred pound bags of sugar and maybe a, a, a case of prunes and whatever. But he would put in sufficient supplies to do us all winter and practically all summer as well right through. He said that he, he didn't mind bringing home a sleigh load of stuff, but he didn't want my mother bugging him about buying a can of something or other every time he went to town. He, uh, he didn't want to be bothered with that. My father got from his father something that was very, very interesting. I have them here with me today. When my grandfather had a big family, uh, he sort of carried on practicing uh, a bit of medicine and, and things like his father did, like my great-grandfather did. And when my father and the family were young, there seemed to be someone in the neighborhood that was having tooth trouble all the time, and they seemed to think that my grandfather should be the one to look after that problem. So he, in his forge, made a set of pinchers, a set of forceps, to extract teeth. They look very much like modern forceps, the, the, this part. These are the, are the, the pinchers of the forceps that he, that he made in his forge. They were fine for extracting front teeth, but they were not so good for reaching a way back in to get those big back ones. So he was ill-equipped. So he sold a cow for $25 and he proceeded to pay $26 for a complete set of forceps 
for extracting teeth. I took these forceps up and compared them with Dr. Jan Smith's forceps in Markdale and they're very much the same although these are well over a hundred years of age and the chrome is off of them. My father said many times that some would, co would come in on Sunday morning my grandfather would extract their tooth and send them on their way. Also my father said many times during the haying or harvest operation someone would come to get a tooth extracted and they would come back to the to the field to my grandfather and he would send one of the boys to the house to get the forceps and they'd bring them back and he'd set them down in a stuke of grain and extract the tooth. Now there was no antiseptic in those days, there was no such thing, there was no dentist either. So this is why as tough as it was to get a tooth extracted it was better than putting up with the pain because the pain of getting the tooth out only lasted a minute or two where probably the toothache would last for, well, forever. If a tooth was abscessed and was uh, needed more attention, this is the little knife that he used to use to to lance those uh, abscessed teeth. He would let the abscess out and then he would extract the tooth. When he was not doctoring uh, human beings in some way, he was doctoring animals. I remember my father saying that when he was a little boy they seldom had a garden because my dad was away looking after somebody or their animals all the time and he was very rarely at home. There was uh, what is known as horse bleeders that he used to use on the horses. Uh, the farmers in those days, probably it was all wrong, but it was their idea that they uh, uh, had to bleed the horses in the spring because after standing all winter in the stable they had such uh, thick blood in them they had to get it out and get some fresh blood in so somehow they would put this on the horse's neck and give it a whack with a hammer and let some blood out. They would put a, a quill, a, a goose quill in the hole and let some blood out and that was supposed to cure the horse. Probably the poor old horse was so thin from starvation that that's why he wasn't doing well and then they even took more blood out of him. But whatever, that's, uh, that was what he was doing. But my father never practiced any of that type of thing. He, he didn't go into that, although he used to help to doctor the odd cow in the neighborhood. But he certainly didn't take on a community project of extracting teeth and all that. Although he did think that maybe he should let, uh, that I should let him demonstrate these forceps on me when I had a loose tooth. But that never just seemed to work out either. He, uh, he had to change his, his opinions there. Uh, I started to Flesher in high school. I started first to Markdale High School, went there for six months, but things were not quite the way they should be up there. I, I actually went there only till Christmas time. I remember very well things were so out of hand there that one of the teachers would be, would be trying to teach and write something on the board and someone, uh, some of the students would take an ink bottle, a bottle full of ink, and throw it and hit the blackboard and smash the bottle all to pieces and plaster the teacher with ink from head to foot. And it was just an unruly situation. And I was just a little boy raised alone. I never had any brothers or sisters. And, and I didn't uh, like that rough stuff at all, so I quit. And I proceeded to go to Flesherton High School. Now our farm was exactly halfway from Markdale to Flesherton. We had 150 acres. 75 acres was assessed in the Markdale school section. 75 acres was assessed in the Flesherton school section. So we could go to either schools. There was, there was no, uh, no problems uh, there at all. While attending Flesherton High School, I uh, became interested in violin lessons. There was a gentleman who came around by the name of Professor Kyle and he encouraged a lot of the young folks to take lessons. I took some, some violin lessons and I got to be able to play the violin quite nicely. In fact, I ended up playing the violin at dances here and there all over the country after that. It was a lot of marvelous entertainment. People had to make their own, their own entertainment. Uh, we held dances in the little Orange Hall uh, in Orange Valley. There were about 30 or 35 people would attend there. We had a lot of entertainment. They would have in there a lot of box socials, which were very interesting things, where the ladies would all bring lunch, all packed in very, very beautiful boxes, and then the boys would bid on them. And whoever bid the most on a certain box had the privilege of having their 
supper with that particular girl. But sometimes the, the, the most beautiful uh, box didn't always contain the best lunch or the best looking girl either for that matter, but <laughs> they, they got what they paid for. <laughs> they bought according to the box. There was, seemed to be always a window open and, and uh, there were some mischievous uh, people in the community at that time, one being Clarence Alcox who always could manage to reach in through the window and snitch a pie off the table and <laughs> have, some, have a little bit of extra lunch. Uh, before I started to take uh, uh, violin lessons, I had taken a number of piano lessons and, and so I could play the piano a bit at these little local functions as well. Uh, we walked uh, to school. It was three miles to Flesherton High School and uh, the farmers were so kind. I remember very well a lot of farmers would stop and, and pick us up and bring us on their sleighs and so on. I remember one man in particular that was very, very kind was Joe Stinson. He used to drive the cream sleigh from Markdale, picking up cream in the Flesherton area, and he would have a load of cream and be going to back to Markdale at, in the evening with a load of cream, and I'd always come home with, uh, with Joe when, when he was on his route. And he was one beautiful man. He was so kind to, to each one of the children. I remember one particular time my father came to get me with the team and sleigh in Flesherton, and uh, I, guessed he, I guess he had, had put his horses in the, in the church shed, I don't know. But as we were coming down through the village, uh, there was a car running in, in uh, front of the bank. And uh, uh, there was no one in it, it was just sitting there running. And my I said to my father, my goodness, I'll bet someone's in there robbing the bank. And uh, I said, I should get out and take the keys out of that car. And he said, don't get such weird ideas. And he kept on going. Well, when we got home, Word had come that the bank had been robbed, and that was the car that was sitting on the street. And whoever robbed the bank got into the car and and uh, headed towards uh, Priceville and Durham area. And there was a gentleman, now I'm not absolutely certain, but I think his name was Harry Wilson. And when, uh, when he heard of the bank been robbed, he ran in the house and got a great big high-powered rifle and fired a whole lot of shells out towards Ceylon or Priceville, right down the middle of the road. Now the people were long gone, he might have killed somebody. But I guess that's what you'd call buck fever, but he certainly got excited over that deal. <laughs> but you missed a chance of being a hero, Frank. Well, it, it, was, it looked logical to me why a car would be running there, and uh, no one in that car. But anyway, that's, that's uh, what took place. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, further my education, but uh, my father uh, was very kind, but he had his own ideas, and he said that the only way, the only uh, thing that he would finance my ed further education into was going through for an undertaker. I seemed to want to be a dentist. Now, I don't know whether these old instruments had anything to do with it or not, but uh, my ambition was to go through for a dentist. But my father said if I was going on to school, I was going to do what he wanted me to do, and that was to go through for an undertaker. Well, that didn't uh, have such a great appeal for me, so I quit school right away. But I did learn one thing from that. I did learn that when young folks have an ambition in a certain direction and parents choose to interfere or dictate or whatever terminology we would like to use uh, and restrict that young person's ambition and direct them into another course very often a young person can get discouraged and it it certainly shows up in in uh, uh, the results of those decisions it certainly did in my decision anyway and I, I, I didn't uh, achieve my any further education I quit high school and went home to work on the farm with my father. And I always enjoyed the farm work. I enjoyed the out of doors very much. And it seemed about that time that, uh, that uh, I started to have problems with lightning. My mother and I were doing the, the milking one uh, evening. My father had gone to choir practice. He had, uh, uh, there was a special occasion in Ansley United Church in Markdale and there was a special practice and he went 
to practice. And we stayed home to milk the cows, and we had the cows milked and everything, and were just separating the milk when the lightning hit the barn. There was an awful blast, and there was a terrible big uh, uh, ball of fire on the stable floor. It cleaned the stable floor off completely and shocked the cows, shocked my mother and I badly, knocked several of the cows down, and uh, they, uh, we got them outside. We thought the barn would burn. We ran to the house. We didn't know what to do. We had no hydro. It was dark and raining and, and, and just had the lantern. We went into the house and sat down, and my mother said, well, she said, there's only one way that we can prevent this, farm, uh, this uh, barn from burning, and that's to call on the Lord. She said, it's out of our hands. We can't do one thing about it. We went in and sat down on the old Chesterfield, and I never heard a prayer like that in my life. My mother poured out a petition to God to say, spare that barn because it was depression time, and we certainly didn't have any money to be building barns. And it was, it was just tremendous to hear a, a dedicated Christian lady pour out her soul to the Lord. And she did that. We went over to Coburn's. We didn't want to stay there in case her prayer wouldn't be answered. So we went over to Coburn's, and my father came home in a little while and went to put the horse in. He couldn't get the horse near the barn. The smell of sulfur was so strong off that lightning. So he phoned Coburn's, and we were there. He came over and got us, and, and we went home. He never did get the horse in the barn that night. He had to unharness the horse out in the stable, outside of the stable, and, and carry the harness in because the horse wouldn't go near the barn with that smell. A little while after that, Raymond McFadden and I went fishing down on the little Saugeen River near uh, Alcox's there, halfway from Markdale to Flesherton. And uh, there come up a thunderstorm, and we went into the barn to get out of the rain. There was an old log barn there. Raymond and I went into that old log barn, and we set our steel fishing rods up against the logs, and I said uh, to Raymond, you know, those logs, those rods shouldn't be there. If, uh, if that lightning ever hits this barn, that, that they might uh, draw that lightning towards us. So I reached up and shoved them out between the logs, so they, they were outside, the, the points were on the ground. And I wasn't any more than over in the middle of the mow again until there was one tremendous blast and the lightning hit that barn. We were frightened. We ran out of there and ran down and under the bridge, the Saugeen River, and uh, stood in water up to our knees till the storm was over and we went up to get our fishing rods. And then uh, when, we, when we went to lift the fishing rods, I said to Raymond, look what's go gone on here. The lightning had gone down those fishing rods and the rods had grounded the lightning into the ground and there was a hole blown in the ground with that lightning that you could put a four pound honey pail, uh, pail in right at the point of those rods. Now if those rods had been aimed our way, we'd certainly would have never knew what hit us. A year or so after that, uh, I decided that I should change the oil in the car in the middle of another thunderstorm, and in the process, the lightning hit the building that I was in. My father, as much as said, I told you so, you should stay in when it's storming. But uh, that wasn't so serious. That just knocked a lot of slivers out of the building, but I didn't really get a shock off that one. But we were fixing, building a new road fence uh, and a new lane fence. When the highway was widened, I well remember when the highway was widened, and they gave the farmers uh, wire to put on their own fence. The, the, the government supplied the wire, but the farmers had to supply the, the labor. So my father had the road fence all built, and we were building the lane fence at the south end of the lane. And we were holding the wire and the stretchers and everything. I had my leg and my shoulder and my head and my legs holding this wire and the stretchers. And the lightning hit a post at the road and it came in with a blast and I got, I guess, the whole thing. It knocked me down and I didn't uh, remember anything. Four hours later I came to in a, cup of, a tub of cold water on the middle of the kitchen floor with Dr. Brown pouring cold water down my spine. That, that brought me to. That's an experience and a half, a hot summer day with cold water going down your spine. But I couldn't get up for a long time after that. I didn't have any pain, but I had a lot of nerve damage. But I had all I, the lightning uh, encounters that I wanted. That did me for, for quite a little while.